Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. And we're going to be joined shortly by France legend. And Johnny, your partner in crime, I think, judging by how much time you're spending together nowadays. Best mates. Matteo Bastro is coming on for a chat about his own career, Fabien Galtier, where this current front side are in the revolution. Much more, I'm sure. Plus, of course, we'll be analysing what went wrong in Marseille as France were humbled by Ireland and what might happen as they travel to Murrayfield this weekend. You've been busy, Johnny, at the start of this week. You had a weekend off, didn't you? How was it? Oh, glorious. <laughs> uh, not sure my missus enjoyed it any more or less than a normal weekend when I'm away working, but mate, it was just nice to be able to sit, have a beer, watch Six Nations weekend, Friday night, then all Saturday. Um, bit of post-traumatic stress disorder, bit of the old PTSD after Scotland's performance on Saturday, <laughs> France on Friday night. Um, it wasn't all easy watching, but it was just really nice to be detached, sit down, relax, have a beer and enjoy it. A cracking weekend to watch as a casual fan or as a keen rugby nose like yourself. But from a French perspective, it was not good. So this is supposed to be one of the best front sides we've seen, at least for a good long while. But that was their worst home defeat in the championship for 110 years since 1914. Oh. So oh. given some of the sides we've seen in between that were quite mm -hmm. ordinary and didn't lose by that big a margin. What went wrong? And is it a case of this island side is probably one of the best sides we've seen in the tournament for a good long time as well? But from a French perspective, yeah, what happened? Well, I think pre-World Cup, people in the Northern Hemisphere wanted to see Ireland-France as the final. So that was the game that people wanted. Two teams in the Northern Hemisphere, top of their game, flying. Ireland had been on top of the game for maybe 36 months. You know, number one side in the world, France, resurgent, new coach, new generation of players. Um, it didn't happen. And for France and for French supporters, they didn't get the home World Cup win that they wanted. They didn't get anywhere near as far as they wanted. So I think for a lot of people, this was, you know, this is a chance to show the revenge. This is what we wanted. Take all that rage out, the, you know, the physical, the psychological, the scarring for the players. This was their chance to start with a bang. But if there was one team for me that you didn't want to play against in the opening game of this championship, it was Ireland. Um, extremely well organized, uh, federation run. So players are rested, they're fresh, they're ready to go. Really well coached, uh, top class individuals uh, and well rehearsed. And, and given that context against the French who have lost Thibaut Giroud, their physical prep coach, uh, they've lost their backs coach, uh, they've lost their forwards coach, Karim Ghazal. Everything behind the scenes had kind of shuffled against the uncertainty of we've just lost this home World Cup. And I think that that game against Ireland, who were exceptional, like let's not get away from that fact. Ireland were great and played very, very well and were smart in how they knocked France back, didn't allow them gain line, kept them on the back foot. And some areas of France's game were absolutely disastrous. Like, look at their lineouts, seven lineouts lost. Like, when was the last time that you saw a French side do that? Um, but that comes from new coaches coming in, new systems, new personnel. Gabriel Ag started as well, who we haven't seen in the international circuit for years. So there's all these little things that went on behind the scenes. It was a sort of perfect storm that was left to brew. And then the performance and the result was catastrophic for French fans, for the team and for French rugby in general. So it hasn't been a great week. The backlash over here has been um, fairly monstrous, shall we say, to say the least. Um, and they're not happy. And, and look, this now leaves Fabian Galtier. Game coming this weekend at Murrayfield. This is the first chance potentially under his reign. Yes, they've just had their first and worst home defeat in 110 years in the championship, but the first time potentially they lose three on the bounce, which really would not be good. On game two for... French rugby to be out of the Six Nations would be a bit of a shock. So loads of bits swirling around that sort of meant that it wasn't an easy game day. Uh, they probably weren't ready, I would say physically or mentally, and they were made to look very average. We'll come to some of the backlash as we go through the episode, but we've got to talk about the red card. Obviously, we don't know what would have happened if they'd have remained with 15 men. Paul Willemse is obviously a friend of the show, and you kind of yep. mentioned it last week, how much he'd be wanting to finish on his own terms and the emotional side of things. So it was tough to watch that, but he made two errors 
that were just big tackle technique, tackle high errors, weren't they? Look, he's a big physical imposing presence. And I mean, that like you can take what we talked about it previously, but wanting to make your mark is one thing, but getting it right, especially in that position and the type of play that Paul's renowned for, big physical clear outs. Um, and he missed that World Cup because of injury. He wanted to make an impact. He wanted to make his presence felt. He just got it wrong twice. And that happens, right? People get it wrong. But again, that just compounded the scenario that already wasn't looking good for the French side. You look at yeah. all the components, you know, defensively, like the try they shipped where Jonathan Dante's basically left clutching straws. They weren't getting their folding right. They weren't their numbers. But then your line out is then even further destructured. Your, your scrum and your mall is underpowered. So... Like Paul's red obviously had a big impact on the game. There were less to, left to play for probably 60 minutes of that game with 14 men, which doesn't help. Um, but yeah, just sad for him um, that his return ended on that note, a red card. He probably misses the next few games. Um, and you've now got Manny Miafu, you've got Pasola Tualagi coming in. Alaga, who as well from Toulon, who looks like he might be on the bench this weekend, hasn't been named yet, but he's been training with the squad. Um, so yeah, just very disappointing for him. Um, that his comeback went in that manner. It was really sad to watch. And we'll come to where France go from here a lot more, obviously with Mathieu Vastro shortly. But do they need to go back to basics a little bit or is that too simplistic? Because they were built, this France iteration, on a good defence, a good kicking game. Those kind of basic skills that you can rely on when there are big pressure moments. And that all seemed a little bit off against Ireland, who obviously are the best drilled side in the world, arguably. But that Sean yeah. Edwards defence just seems like it's a little bit misfiring. They, they've they conceded four or more in four of 81 games, Sean Edwards, Wales and France. Three of those have come in the last five matches with France. So there's something going on, isn't there? Yeah. But then it's a continue. We talk about this all the time. That That's the beauty of rugby and sport is that you're continually trying to evolve. I mean, you cannot win a game of rugby if your line out, like the statistic chance of you winning a game of rugby if your line out is at 50% is yeah. nigh on zero. So like you have to sort your line out, your scrum, they weren't getting any dominance or penalties from that. Um, defensively, that's the really interesting one. You're a man down, everyone's exhausted, but you have to also credit the Irish attack. The, the ways that they opted to to get their first phase options, you know, simple plays like from scrum, they were attacking blind sides, getting behind the French pack, uh, pinning them back, getting them on the back foot and then never allowing them that upper hand. Once France were on the back foot, they never got a chance to, to sprint off the line and come up and, and make dominant tackles. So the Irish attack was also very cute and very effective. Um, but there are simple elements of their game, even things like Antoine Dupont not being there. And again, I don't think he would have made that much of a difference in terms of the general game plan because they were so much on the back foot and they had no ball. But his kicking game, you saw how Ben White's kicking game had a massive effect on Wales in the first half at Cardiff. Antoine Dupont released so much pressure with his kicking game when he's there. Um, so yeah, line out, simplicity of being back to the full complement of 15 blokes, uh, getting over a gain line, simple templates that they use so well. But like ultimately the weekend, they had no decent ball to play off. And you'd expect back to 15, you also would expect a big emotional reaction because classically any French team, whether at top 14, Pro D2, National or International, that loses at home, you're poking a bear. You're, you're waking a beast. You're making a team very angry and you can guarantee they will come out with an emotional reaction this weekend and they'll want to set things straight. So yes, back to basics, um, but across the board, they have to be much, much better because... That's what we're used to seeing, right? That's what we've seen since Fabian Galti took over is incredibly high standards, well-drilled, line-out, scrum, starter plays, multi-phase, and defensively. Also, their kicking game, very pragmatic, but they were out-kicked as well by Ireland. So every single asset that they were out-fought, out-worked, or out-thought by Ireland, um, and they'll need to raise their game for Murrayfield this weekend. Out-kicked and also in defence, do they have issues under the high ball? Because South Africa exposed them. I mean, there were a lot of high bombs in that quarterfinal, but a couple of tries came from them and again yeah. against Ireland. But, but this is what I've been saying all along about playing. If I was, if you're playing against the blitz defence, there's no point running into it. Unless you can knock them back on the first phase, your best option is to kick. And what we've seen is South Africa at the World Cup, 
exploiting backfield. Um, and we saw as well Ireland like opting to run the ball back 50 meters, then going sort of Gary Owen high ball and creating 50 50s in the backfield where we saw Damian Peno struggle a little bit. Uh, Moefana is Biai Barry going to come in this weekend? I don't know. Toma Ramos as well. Like all these guys will be under pressure. So teams have seen now different ways of exploiting or targeting the French side, but it's up to the French side, as we said, to continue to evolve. It's a big old physical game of chess. Get smarter, uh, find different ways to attack and defend properly and work your way into the game. So yeah, they're going to be attacked in different ways. That Other teams have now got their number in certain elements uh, and it's up to them to to improve. Right, we'll get Mathieu Bastro on very shortly to get his take on what happened in Marseille and where France go from here. Look ahead to that Scotland game at Murrayfield a lot more. But there was a busy round of top 14 action as well at the weekend. So let's have a very quick chat about that and see potentially if that's where your meter moment of the week comes from, Johnny. It wasn't from the top 14. Okay. Any mentions? Was... Have you seen Antoine Dupont's off though? Yes, that's what I thought was coming. Oh, outrageous. Antoine Dupont against my old side Bayonne. And again, seven tries they knocked up. Antoine Dupont was playing at 10. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of the boys were exceptional. Ruma, Jack Willis, Richie Arnold, all imposing. Bonus point win. But there's one phase of play. And again, we'll share it on our stories on Instagram. But he charges down Teague Bergen in the backfield, picks the ball up, and then no look out the door. I mean, nonchalant as you like pass to Pitaki, who basically jogs over to dot down. But all Antoine Dupont, the work, uh, the skill set, the belief in his... And again, he probably could have walked over himself, but he just yeah. flicked into Pitaki, like sublime piece of skill. But that isn't my meter moment of the week, Tim. You mentioned he was playing 10, Johnny. Did you see the clip as well of him yes. sat in the number nine spot in the change room and Grau asked to say, me belong one, Antoine. Would you eat yeah, him there, wouldn't you? Yeah, mate, it doesn't bother me. Again, that's that's just scrum half being scrum half. Mate, you're in the wrong city. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> but Antoine, like, clearly he's in at halftime. He looked like in a world of pain as well, like mm. physically exhausted. And, you know, you've got your normal place where you sit. He's normally in the nine, and he comes in and Paul, hey, mate, like, you're 10. Can you just nudge up? <laughs> Imposing themselves, these scrum halves. Um, but, yeah, ridiculous. Mate, my meter moment of the week is from a new kid on the block. And a moment he had after the game, I thought he was absolutely phenomenal. Again, for people watching rugby in France, he's probably a little bit of an unknown, but Joe McCarthy. Yes. I mean, he was monstrous. And I, again, not watching Leicester that often, Leicester that often, you know, you think Ryan, who co-captain previously at the World Cup, you think he's going to start, but Paul O'Connell and Andy Farrell have other ideas. In comes Joe McCarthy. And the way that boy gets around the field, how he carries, how he impacts, his work at the line out, his steals. Um, he was exceptional. And again, listening to the French commentary here, they're like, who is this kid? Because he was just that good. Everything he did sort of touched the gold. Um, so worthy of the man of the match award. But the moment that I thought was touching and very nice, you might have seen this. He gets presented mm -hmm. with his man of the match award and his brothers in the stand is his brother's got Down syndrome and he's over time with his family celebrating the win and, you know, picks up that medal and drapes around his, his brother's neck. And I thought that was, you know, a really nice moment. The performance aside was phenomenal, but to share that with your family that are over, um, to see you win in Marseille against France and then to, to give that to your brother, I thought was very, very cool. So that is this weekend's meter moment of the weekend. Hard to argue with that. Hell of a performance and an emotional moment with it after the game. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week, and meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer. Recently making over 20 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan, and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can get 10% off any full-price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD10 and you get 10% off any full price item at meter.com. Very quickly on the top 14, Johnny, because we want to bring Mathieu in. Bordeaux won away in the big one on Sunday night at Toulon. First ever win at Stade Mayol. It ain't great for Toulon at the minute, mate. We're not going to talk to Basta too much about Toulon because <laughs> I was down, and again, we'll chat about what we've been up to, but I was down with him in Toulon yesterday, which was Monday. And yeah, it ain't great. They should have won that game. I mean, Bordeaux are very good and they hung in that game, but 
interception try from Madosh Tambwe. How quick is he, by the way? He hasn't mm. had much game time this year because of Peno and Biai Barre at, at Bordeaux, but he was phenomenal. Uh, Deporter, the outside centre, scored at the death. Um, but if you look back, mate, and the manner of the tries, like Toulon have the ball in Bordeaux's 22. They set up a mall to basically kill the game. There's 65 seconds left and they spew out the back of them all. Bordeaux pick up three passes, they get down the wing, and they win the game. Deporter wins it for Bordeaux. I mean, it's historic for Bordeaux, but there really is a little bit... I don't know. It's a wee bit crisis nature at Toulon at the minute, but it's a bit schoolboyish in how they lost that game and the type of tries they're conceding. So, yes, Bordeaux were exceptional. They hung in the game. You look through that squad, Tatafu... Uh, Tapawai. I mean, they have some phenomenal players. Deporter is going to be an absolute star as well. He actually came out yesterday and said, disappointed to be released by France. I still want to play in the Six Nations. I've got what it takes. Like, totally backing himself, really confident. But for Toulon, mate, it's not great. Um, they just don't look settled. They don't look cohesive in what they're trying to do. Um, and that's another loss at home. So all is not well. I'd imagine this week there'll be a few meetings if you listen to Danny Brennan, they should probably go to the beach bar. They should probably have a few head-to-heads <laughs> and sort themselves out. Um, but a huge historic for Bordeaux. I mean, it's historic. It's very, very cool. And you look through that team, Tammy Funa, Kane Douglas, Tapu, like some of the names they've got um, during the Six Nations weekends. They're an outrageous team on paper. So well done to them. And they are now level with Stade Francais and Toulouse on 41 points at the top of the table because Racing have led the table all season. They were well beaten at Perpignan, weren't they? They were a bonus point for Perpignan as mm-hmm. well. So that's a big old win. Very impressive for them. The other one that stood out this weekend was the away win for Cast in Po, um, which I didn't see coming. But there's maybe a shift. You had Popelin, who's been playing 10. He moved to fullback. And that left Louis Lebrun coming back from injury to step in at 10. Uh, Kokaji and Botitu, they were phenomenal in the centres and Santi Arata was a menace um, as he always is so a big result on the road for Cast as well, 44-33 away from home, that's a big old result for them, um, so yeah, it's always interesting these Six Nations weekend sides that don't lose too many people, they sort of manage to squeeze these wins out um, when other sides are losing a few more players um, and yeah, bit of a shift in the in the table, so be interesting come the end of the Six Nations window Right, let's bring our guest on now and we can have a chat with former Six Nations Grand Slam winner, top 14 winner, three-time Champions Cup winner, Matthew Bastro joins us. How you doing? Hello. I'm good. I'm good and you. Thank you very much for joining us. And we'll come on to France shortly and a bit about your career as well. But you've been spending quite a lot of time with Johnny recently, haven't you? So has he been treating you well? Yeah, well, he's like my, uh, my second wife. <laughs> because, uh, we work a lot together yeah. <laughs> I feel more like his agent to be honest <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> maitress and uh, agent that's it mistress yeah. and agent we'll take that <laughs> um, Johnny was telling me that yesterday he had you playing the bagpipes which is interesting but I also want to hear about when you went to the Moulin Rouge because this the thought of you and Johnny doing the can-can together is something that most people can't get their heads around. How was that? Uh, it was very physical. Very <laughs> physical. And uh, I didn't expect that. I think I just coming for, you know, a chat in the Moulin Rouge because it's a famous place in, in France. And uh, when I saw the, um, the performer, I said, whoa, we are in trouble. And she, uh, she, um, the the um, show us some uh, some skills. I said, "Whoa, why?" Uh, <laughs> I understand why uh, I stopped my career uh, in May. I can't <laughs> too physical. But that's the thing. I think for anybody that knows the Moulin Rouge, you don't go to the Moulin Rouge expecting to have a conversation. You go expecting for it to get physical in one way or another. But it, it was great fun. I mean, yesterday as well, I mean, playing the bagpipes on the beach in Toulon, that was also a very nice experience and a good surprise. And how is Johnny with the bagpipes, Matthew? Because he's Scottish, so I'm assuming that he's really good with the bagpipes. He can play a tune, yeah? Yes, he's good. He's good. I think it's, uh, 
it's just you know second uh, second skin you know yeah. it's easy for him very easy put it this way <laughs> Basta and I are the same level that's all I'm gonna say and then that was my first time that was his first time geez it's harder than I thought like I kind of took it for granted as a bit of a national sport but um like my lung capacity clearly I have a lung capacity of a couple of crisp packets um <laughs> Because it's hard work, really hard work. We also had Phil Fitzgerald. I don't know if you remember Phil Fitzgerald. He came down to join us. I played with Phil. We had one test together, played for Scotland A against Georgia in 2008. But he played for Toulon for like 15 years. Yeah. He's now a lawyer, yeah. still working there. Lovely guy. Uh, and he came down and joined us for lunch and a bit of piping as well, because he's a real piper. Um, so it was good to have him join us too. Yeah, when he came um, uh, in, in Toulon, he was in the academy. Under 19 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just fell in love with Toulon. And he stayed. He played for the, for, for the senior team. He was captain. Two-time uh, French champion of uh, the second division. And uh, yeah, he's still, he's still here. And uh, he helped um, he help the, the club sometimes. Uh, we When we have some bad guy uh doing some commission <laughs> UPC a commission you help some guys well what he's alluding to is when there's a disciplinary panel for basta which has happened a few times phil's the one that represents him which is quite nice yeah yeah <laughs> excellent we've covered the can can we've covered the bagpipes we should probably talk rugby so Mathieu, ireland are a well-oiled machine we know how good they are but what did you make of the game in marseille from a french perspective um we was uh we was in shock we was in shock because uh we all know it's gonna be a um a tough game uh but i think after five ten minutes we was all like oh it's gonna be very hard and because we we don't have uh we didn't have ball um in defense uh we were poor in defense uh it was very very difficult and uh after after um, at the half time we said oh we are we are very lucky to just you know uh, seven points uh to the to the irish guy boys and um and uh, yeah sure after the, the the red car we say oh we can't we can't win today but uh, um I'm, I'm sure at maybe at with 15 players, 14 players, it's going to be the same result uh, because Ireland was in a, another level at uh, at this moment. We were talking about it before you came on, but Ireland was probably the worst team to play against as your first game after the World Cup. Do you get the sense there's maybe a little bit of a hangover for the players, both mentally and physically, after their World Cup exit? We don't, we didn't have this feeling in France because, uh, you know, uh, in, we was, uh, you know, good in the um, Champions Cup, uh, with, uh, Toulouse, uh, La Rochelle in the, at the end, not of the beginning. Uh, we was, uh, pretty confident, you know, and, uh, we said, oh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a chance. It's the best occasion to, to switch on a, a new things after the the, the lose in um, in World Cup, and uh, it was a good opportunity against Ireland, but um, I think it's it's start changing two weeks before the game. We uh, when the media start uh, talking every day about the quarter final, every day. Oh, do you think uh, the play? Um, you know the, um, the 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 pain uh, uh, of the of the um, after the lose against South Africa. Uh, um, the players still thinking of that. Uh, the supporter. Uh, the climate was changed. You know, it was very very. I think it was very difficult for the player to stay focused on Ireland. When all the people around the player ask about South Africa, and Fabian Galtier has obviously done a very good job with this France side over the last four years. They were so close at a home World Cup. 
they were playing great rugby. That's just one game, but he will obviously feel the pressure this week. You know him. Is there a danger that things will all implode? He will do certain things to get the players' backs up, or is this just a one-off and we'll see a backlash this week and France will be back to their best? You know, in France, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's very different because you know when we lost the game, we won't change everything. We won't change everything, and we we forgot it's the first game of the Six Nation. You 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 can always win the Six Nation. Uh, so I think uh, the confidence and Fabien Galtier. Um, um, change a little bit, uh, but we uh, we all know if we if we if if we win in Scotland, nobody um, talk on on on, on this uh, loss again. So play, the, the players and the French team need to to just. Maybe uh, stay focused on the game um, and uh, take uh, take care of uh, of them each other because uh, you know after one game, a lot of uh, uh, critical on the press about uh, players, coach, um, uh, strategy, uh, everything. Just after one one game, uh, I think it's because. Uh, during maybe four years, they uh, they play so so well, so well. So now the fans and uh, the press are very um, very critical. Yeah, uh, yeah, they are very critical now because uh, during four four years, they uh, they eat good food with the French team. And now, when you are maybe one time, two time pro food, you are very critical. They're used to those high standards. So when there was a dip in performance at the weekend, there was a big reaction over here from the media, from all the written media, from all the like, from social media as well. Every all the comment, all the comments and supporters were really harsh on the French team. But there must be an appreciation as well, Mathieu, for the rising standards that the French team has had over the past four seasons because like we've had like different eras under different coaches before and it was a difficult period for French rugby whereas yeah. this is just a one-off game but the consistency and performance under Fabian has been much better and it has been well received right? Yeah and um, uh, you know we say in France we have a, a short memory we have a short memory uh, me I was I was there uh, when it was very difficult for the French team, it was, uh, you know, just uh, we we finished maybe four, five as a Six Nation. It was a terrible uh, situation for the French team, and uh, and Galtier arrived with um, a, a young uh, generation, and during four season, um, you know, they, they put the French team like uh, where. Um, well, uh, in the position, uh, all the all the amateur in France want to see the French team compete with uh, the best nation. So, uh, after one game, you can't, you know, uh, um, you know, ask uh, uh, a revolution, change the coaching, uh, uh, bring back some player, out some player. It's too, it's too easy. It's too easy. It's a new adventure. Uh, it's a new adventure. Uh, okay, it's a, it's the same uh, coach. Uh, maybe eighty percent of the player was in the World Cup, but it's a it's it's a new 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 cycle, new uh, cycle for the next World Cup. Um, and in, but in front we are not passionate. So, and Johnny's been coached by Fabian Galtier and has told us what he's like so from your point of view Fabian was your coach wasn't he right at the start of your career at Stade Francais and then towards the end as well at Toulon so give us an insight into what he's like as a as a coach and as a man Fabian is uh, maybe the best coach I had during my career um, 
me give me the opportunity to play in top 14 when I had uh, 18 years old in, in Paris. And uh, for me, it, it was a... Uh, I was lucky because uh, uh, at this moment in center, you had uh, Liebenberg, uh, Messina, Stefan Gla. There was Mirko Bergamasco. They were all in a national team. And me, I just come from my... Uh, um, um, young young team of Massy in third division, and uh, and he gave me the the confidence, and I start my first game against uh, Toulouse, and uh, at Toulouse, so it was a it's, it wasn't a, a good present because we lost, but uh, it's like that. But he's uh, he's a big, better. I think he's the best technician I I, I know. Uh, I had a lot of great coach like uh, Bernard Laporte. Bernard Laporte is, is I think, is is the best I know for the leading the um, the the players. You know, in the men, you after one speech uh, of him, you want to to go to you know to 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 the war for him, and uh, it's the management is. Very different, and um, after um, it's why it's why I think uh, a lot of people are um, confident of Fabian because they know he's the best. So we we are not uh, uh, you know we are not um, um, in danger, but we are just after the frustration of the of the World Cup. We expect, you know, it's uh, uh, just, uh, um, you know, a mistake, this lose, or because of the referee. And this game against Ireland maybe show us what uh, we don't want to see, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, some, you know, the, the problem on the high ball, uh, you know, some problem like that. So sometimes it's uh, very hard and difficult to to watch to see the verity uh, in, in front. Johnny, what Mathieu says there echoes exactly what you've said about Fab- Fabian Galtier. The, the best coach you've had, technically brilliant, but just listening to that comparison with Bernard Laporte, perhaps man management is the area, one area perhaps where he might not be as strong as some other coaches. So in that respect, this will be a huge challenge this week, won't it? Because he'll have to manage those players and get them back up. You have to manage those players, but I imagine, and I imagine Basta will feel the same, like there will be a big internal reaction from this group of players in that they've had that big disappointment at the World Cup. Now I think everybody was waiting for a reaction to see something in Marseille. It didn't come. Now I think from the player, and that, doesn't have to be Fabian that drives that. I think that from the players, from Greg Aldrich, from the captain, from the senior players group, from Gail Fiku, Joe Dante, they will all want to show a different face this weekend, a different side of their game and prove something. And so I imagine, Matthew, for you as well, after having watched that game and that loss against Ireland, now the French side, they will expect a big reaction. Surely after losing, after having lost at home, they'll be a dangerous and different animal at Murrayfield this weekend. Yeah, for sure, for sure, because uh, um, you know, s- since uh, four years, it was like um, um, a fairy tale. You know, it's like a fairy tale. No, uh, um, every everybody was uh, behind the team, uh, the fans, the partners. Everything was uh, was um, you know uh, perfect for the player. And now, I think it's uh, the first time uh, this team uh, are under, under pressure of the, of the press and, and um, all the people, you know, who, who love this team. So now they have to, to, to show their, uh, their character in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Edinburgh. But we, um, we are not me. I'm not uh, afraid. Uh, I, I know they're gonna be here after uh, 
uh, yes, I'm confident they're going to show an, uh, um, another face, but we we have to um, to be humble because we're going to play Scotland and Scotland uh, have um, a magnificent team uh, with um, my man, the, the Scottish Messi. Uh, <laughs> the Scottish Messi, uh, uh, the center to pull it uh, wake me up at uh, at the Challenge Cup final uh, in Dublin. My, I, I didn't take a, a, a contact like that a lot of my career, but it wake me up. <laughs> <laughs> and they have a lot of um, good players, a lot of talent. So it's it's gonna be a, a, a good game. And uh, for us, for the French team, we we are waiting. We are expect a uh, lot of character, lot of uh, uh, another uh, another face uh, than Ireland. And uh, I think uh, me, if I'm a, if I play for Scotland, I say I think it okay. The loss against Ireland. They, uh, they they play very bad against Ireland, but I think this, this is a good moment to uh, play against French team and uh, you know um, put him under uh, uh, pressure and uh, maybe uh, you know in the in the I think the first fifteen minutes uh, for for this game will be very important. Because uh, if uh, we are under pressure and uh, you know under high, under the high ball, we'll start lost collision the ball. You start you know thinking about uh, last last week. You say oh maybe the same things and it's very different. So if you were Fabian Galtier and you've got Alcatraz and you've got the coaching staff there, what would you be saying to your group of players and where do you think you could apply pressure? To this Scottish team to beat them in Edinburgh. I think um, <clears throat> in France we we talk uh, a lot of the all the strategy, the um, deposition uh, game. You know, like uh, we after after the loss after um, South Africa, uh, we all start to, to to speak about strategy, how to play without the ball, put pressure on the on the um, on the on the opponent team, but I think we are the the best when we have the ball, when we uh, play with intensity. Uh, we have we we have the chance to have some magical player like uh, Peno, uh, Ramos, um, uh, Jalibert. So just let the, the this man play. Let them to play. Uh, I know the tactic. Uh, the, the tactic is very, uh, very important. But when you have this, uh, their talent in the in the team, just make sure they are confident for um, you know show uh, their talent in the during the game. And uh, we all we um, we watch the game um, well. So, uh, uh, in Wales for the Scotland team, we saw the second half when the when Wales put the intensity uh, and uh, and the passion. It was hard for Scotland, but at the same time, I I don't think uh, Scotland gonna be the same mistake. So it's why I think it's gonna be a, a, a great game. Before we come on to talking about your career, Mathieu. This weekend, selection will be interesting, won't it? Because we, friend of the show, Paul Willemser, is obviously going to be missing. Roman for Fenua is still out. Would you start for Solo Tuilangi? Me, yes, because I, I, I love uh, this type of player. But uh, he's, uh, he's young. He's young. I think we, 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 we have to, we have to keep a process with him. Uh, and don't burn 
him too soon. Uh, last week it was uh, his first cap against Ireland. He um, he did a good uh, a good entrance, and I think he 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 still learn. He still learn. So let him let him time during this Six Nation learn, and maybe this summer uh, uh, pick him. Uh, I think the tour is in Australia. Argentina, Australia, I don't, I don't Argentina, remember. Argentina, and you pick him for uh, the the summer tour, and you give him, um, you know, a starter starter role. But it, I'm, I, I will be happy if uh, if he starts, but I don't want, uh, you know, the the burn him too soon, because uh, it's a huge gap. Uh, top 14 and a French team and uh, you know he play uh, every weekend uh, is um, he, he, he play uh, with uh, uh, Perpignan it's not the same team it's not the, with all the respect I have, I have for uh, Perpignan but it's not the same level you know he don't play for the top uh, you know the top place in top 14 so maybe the, the, the gap uh can be too too hard for him and we all know uh when you play your first cap you are you, you are superman because you have the adrenaline you can do you can run uh, maybe for two days <laughs> when you play your first cap so um, we, we have to be patient with him and uh, don't don't burn him too soon Let's talk a little bit about the past now. You're newly retired, yeah. 54 France Caps. Do you have a favorite game, a favorite memory from your career? Uh, uh, I think uh, my first cap, my first cap against Wales in 2009. Uh, it was a crazy story because uh, I wasn't on the squad, uh, and one player uh, got injured during the week on Tuesday. And me, uh, I finished the training uh, with uh, with Paris. I was supposed to go to school, but I was tired. I said, "Oh, I don't go to school." And uh, my coach and my president start calling me, and I was uh, I was um, I was scared because I said, "Oh, they know I didn't go to school. It's me. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm in trouble." And um, I didn't answer. I didn't answer. I said, "Oh, um, I'm thinking about uh, what I um, I will say to to them." You know, the 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 next day, or I'm um, um, uh, I'm sick, or something like that. And uh, after I say, "No, okay," I, I call back the the coach, and I say, "Oh, maybe because he won't." To tell to me, I want to, he wants me to play this weekend, and he said, "Oh, what are you doing?" I said, "Oh, um, I don't feel good. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm sick." He said, "Ah, oh, you're sick, so you can go to the French team." I said, "French team?" He said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they need you. One player is in job, so you are called by uh, for the French team." I said, "Okay." Uh, Oh, French team! Oh, yeah, I was in in panic, in shock. He said, "Oh, you feel better now?" Yeah, 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 I feel better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but the game was uh, was perfect for me. Uh, I played with um, I think one of the greatest center in the in the history, Yannick Josion. Everybody was uh, nice with me, and. Uh, Uh, I did not. Uh, when they, they call me, I say, "Oh, maybe because uh, at this time they don't call thirty uh, or forty-two players. They call just twenty, uh, twenty-three players. So I know I'm gonna play, but I didn't know I'm gonna start. So um, maybe after, maybe one one training session." And he gives a team. I said, "Oh, okay, it's something serious." <laughs> But yeah, one of the my 
best memory and uh, after the for sure the the Grand Slam in 2010 uh, because I realized uh, uh, what is it to to win something with the French team and uh, I remember the, when I was a kid and I watched all the all the players. Uh, uh, Dourt, uh, Dominici, uh, Fabien Pelous, all the, all the, all of my uh, idol, uh, uh, to this and me, I'm the, now I'm the same place. Uh, it's, yeah, it's good feeling, yeah. Very special. And I thought you were going to say your favorite memories were actually just beating Scotland because I'm fairly sure <laughs> we played against each other six times and I won none and you won six. So <laughs> that was no contest as well. I mean, you, like your international career was phenomenal. Grand Slam, what an achievement. But then also on the club level, I mean, it was the club side of everyone's dreams that you played with. You started with Stade Francais, but finishing with Toulon, essentially the barbarian side of the club landscape, playing with Johnny Wilkinson, Matt Gitto, littered with stars. You won the Champions Cup three times. So... What was that like? I think I'm the maybe I'm the luckiest player in the in the history because uh, uh, in Stade Francais and Toulon I played with maybe the the best players uh, you can have uh, in Stade Francais. I played with Sergio Parisse, uh, Juan Martin Hernandez, uh, Christophe Dominici, players like that. And uh, some uh, league legend like uh, Marc Gasnier. Uh, and when I signed in Toulon, I was uh, I was a little bit nervous because uh, when you play with uh, you know you arrive and you have to play with Johnny, Matt Gito, uh, Brian Abana, all of these legends. They, uh, they, they won the World Cup. Um, you feel very, you, you, I felt very small, very small. And uh, I just say it's a, well, I think it's a good occasion for me to learn, to learn from them. And uh, it's why it's, it's what I am, it's what I, I, I did all the, all the time I was with, uh, with them. And, uh, for me, it was my yeah, the best memories in my career is at this uh, uh, period of my life because uh, every time I go to training, I learn something. Every time, every time. Uh, I learn from Johnny, from Matt. I learn from Chris Mazoué, Carl Lehmann, Mackies. Every time, every day it was a lesson. So, um and me, I remember I was the youngest in the in the in the team, and I I I have the same sensation when we you know when you coming out of the and uh, just before you go on the field, I just watch around me. I was like, whoa, it's it's a dream. It's a dream because you play with the one the one to the fifteen. Uh, 30, uh, 23, it's all, all, all of them um, legend. So um, I was lucky to, to be part of uh, this uh, generation. Very modest. I think they would all say they were lucky to play with you as well. Give you the ball, get on the front foot, steal of the course, ball back. Yes, <laughs> of course, yes, of course, yes. Of course, yes. They was lucky. They was lucky because uh, uh, when sometimes we, we had a, a bad situation, they give me the Shit ball to me. <laughs> they're, they're like, wait, wait to old match it. Here's the ball. Get us over the front. Yeah, floor. yeah, yeah. Oh, we are blocked. Oh, basta. Give the... <laughs> Absolutely. And you talk about learning just very briefly. We all know you as a as a world class international centre. And then at the end of your career, you clearly embrace that learning because you become a back rower. So just talk us through how difficult that is. We know you went through a lot of injuries as well towards the end of your career, which must have been mentally very difficult to get through. But physically, that transition from going from a centre to a back row as well, that shows a lot of character to do that. Yeah, it's a different rugby. It's not the same when you play backs and you play forward. It's 
it's not the same thing. And uh, I remember after my first game, I said, oh, I have to apologize uh, a couple of times. Um, I scream on you guys because uh, it's very difficult because you have to, you have to lift. You have to, <laughs> you have to lift, run to the, to the rock. Uh, and um, you know, uh, know the the call in line out. Uh, know your role. Uh, go everywhere on the on the on, on the pitch. It's not. The, it's it's like a marathon. It's like a marathon, and uh, um, it's why I um, I put a lot of respect on the on the forward now because. When you play back, uh, when uh, you know it doesn't work, you it's easy to say, "Oh, oh, work your line out." When I work for that, when I work, <laughs> sometimes because every time, every time, and every team the forward was late uh, when we do the collective training, they are late because of the line out, and when they miss a line out. We all say, when I work for that, when I... <laughs> and they hate that, and they hate that. So after when I play for the forward, I, I say, oh, okay, I understand because it's too difficult. to have uh, so many calls for um, for for the line out, and you have to keep it in your uh, in, in your memory. So yeah, but uh, for me, it's uh, it was a uh, you know, I was lucky in school, you know, because um, it's so different back and forward. And me, I was happy to learn something new at this uh, you know stage of my career, and uh, it was a good good opportunity. When they asked me if I want to play uh, back home, I said nah. I I, I was like, oh you. You do respect me uh, because you think I'm uh, I'm too I'm too old. I'm not I don't have the level anymore to play center. So I was like, yeah, they, they, they don't respect me. But after I take the time to think of that, I said, yeah, maybe it's a good idea because um, I'm I'm less faster than before. And uh, and if I want play uh, longer, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good it's a good deal for me. And uh, and after a couple of training, when I, I try, I say I like. So let's go. I like. Show me the four year contract, and I'll sign. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I see what. I'm... <laughs> yeah. And I love it as well. But that's the thing. It was a massive. Because obviously outside centre is an incredibly difficult position to play in. But your biggest, I think the biggest thing you gave, and you mentioned like for Johnny Wilkinson, he had a front row ticket to the Basta show. If there was ever a problem, front football, we need it, Basta, you can get it. And then you just give it from a different position. You were giving it from number eight. But I love the way that, Tim, finally we have confirmation from Mathieu that actually the forwards, and we knew this already, but we've got now got a back that's played forward has confirmed it, that the forwards work harder, they're actually smarter, <laughs> there's more to deal with. Um, and it made me always think as well, whenever I was doing scrum practice or line-out practice, and I would look over and see the backs doing like kicking practice and just kicking the ball, but I was like, oh man, I would love to be a back. It'd be so much easier. So it must be strange <laughs> for you, having gone from the kicking practice and then going, oh shit, what am I doing over here pushing in scrums, which is not fun. For any position, front row is different, but back row isn't fun either. But the one man, when we look back at those two long days, we've touched on some players. The one man that everybody also loves talking about is Murad, Monsieur Bujalal, your old president. Yeah. And again, you, you were telling me a couple of nice stories, but like you must have some great stories which involve him as well from over the years at Toulon. Murad is a, it's a great character. You love him, you hate him, but it's a, you have to respect him what he achieved in Toulon, what he, what he did for the club, for the city, you have to respect that. After you love him, you hate him, it's, for him, it's, it's the same. And uh, me, I remember after the first Champions Cup, we won in Dublin. 
and uh, we say we don't go out because we had uh, we have the semi final uh, against Toulouse uh, the the next week, and we stay in the hotel and we celebrate in the hotel and uh, maybe at two a.m. three a.m. Uh, we lost the trophy. No trophy in the hotel. We try to. Uh, we 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 don't know, and we ask the the security, well, um, why is the trophy? He said, "Oh, more taking. Why is taking? So we have to go in the find the 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 more the more the room, and we take back the trophy, maybe for uh, two hours, and he he, he called the security of um, his security man." He said, bring back the, 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 the trophy. He said, okay. We let the trophy to, to Morad. But after all the bills, all the champagne, beer, we put on his room <laughs> bill. <laughs> <laughs> we, put, we put everything on his room. And uh, the, the, in the morning before, he said, oh, I don't understand why I have, why I have to pay that. It was all like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's a different era now at Toulon, and you are the team manager now. So, how are you finding life after playing in that role? And give us an idea of what your job kind of involves on a day to day basis. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's totally different for me. It's a, it was a good opportunity. Uh, me, I wanted to maybe play another season, or uh, stop and um, coach under 18. But uh, I, I felt my body was, you know, it was too difficult for me to for playing another season. So uh, um, I wanted to, you know, to to coach under 18. And the coach, Pierre Mignoni, asked me if I want to to to, to stay. With uh, with him with uh, as a, a team manager, um, you know, team manager. Uh, it's you know I I know uh, Tom Whitford, you know, but you never know all of the job you have to do uh, as a team manager. So for me, it was a um, you know it was a. Uh, I, I take that like a new challenge. New challenge and uh, and uh, and stay close to the to the team to the new player new, new generation. Um, I, I try to to give uh, you know some um, um, advice uh, what it means to play it for too long uh, because. Uh, Toulon uh, is not the. It's it's a place very, very um, different than another place in France. Uh, you have a lot of pressure uh, from the fans. Uh, you know we say every time it's like Marseille in in football. Uh, the people here are very uh, um, passionate. They love uh, rugby. They love uh, their club, and they don't like um, when you when you cheat. And um, and when some me, I remember when I signed for Toulon, I had maybe one year of uh, for my adaptation at the at the city uh, and the in the, uh, in the city in, in the team. So me, I try to facilitate for the player, uh, those things like that, and uh, and you know, um, give some uh, identity to the to the to the team. Uh, oh, you sign for Toulon, okay. Now you are for you are in Toulon. Toulon, this is the. This is this, this in this, and not this. And um, I try to 
to give some heritage to the new to to the new player. Um, we all know it's going to be the same than the my generation. They have to create a new story, but me, I have to. I am. I'm here to help them to create that with some. Uh, I think some standard. Uh, you you need to have for play to to them. And there's no better man for the job. That that's the point. That's why Pierre has asked you to come back. You are the link between the staff and the players, the history and the players. You're there also like for the general mental health for their installation, getting them settled, pastoral care, the whole nine yards. So it's a massive job. And and I guess the question to you is, like you're doing this all for everyone else. I know your missus is about to drop with kid number three as well. I've been in the same yeah. situation. It's it's a hard stint at the end when you do finish. So how are you finding in general the transition from playing to a completely different role? Has it been easy? Are you finding it difficult? Are you enjoying it? Uh, in the beginning, I, will, uh, um, I take maybe one one or two months to take my place because when you do, when you play during maybe 16, 70 years, you do, you, you, you did this uh, every day, every second day. When you are in your office, alone in your office for the first time in your life, it's totally strange. But uh, like I said, I take that like a, a, a challenge. I, I change, you know, my routine, uh, my routine days. Uh, now I have more time for my kids, you know, to bring my kid to the school. Uh, take my kid, take my kid to the school too. So, uh, for me, it's, it's, I take that like a very good opportunity to, to have this job. And, uh, the pre, you have pressure, but the pressure is different. It's very different because, uh, me, it's all the organization, the logistic, uh, around the team, uh, so uh, you have the pressure of the if the flight is uh, is uh, is late or the bus uh, uh, is late or something like that. Uh, when you are a player, you are just focused on what you have to do, and uh, that's that's okay. That's uh, it's uh, it's okay. I, I, I'll deal I'll deal with that. My wife is a little bit. Uh, um, uh, um, she, she she's not happy because they never are. They never yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. She, she she's not happy because she said that that you you travel like uh, like when you play. I say yes yeah. because I have to be here. I say but it's like when you play. So what I what I win in the in the in this story? I say oh. <laughs> <laughs> you say when I ask you, you say me yes. So now <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> And I'm assuming you've told her about this weekend. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I have to walk. Uh, <laughs> I go to, uh, I go to Scotland for the for for the game. You call that work? You go to the Scotland yeah. with Johnny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I say uh, I go for walk. Johnny will show you a good time, I'm sure, and call it work. But finally, Mathieu, obviously it's early days. You're doing bits in the media, doing some corporate stuff with Johnny, as we just mentioned. Team manager at Toulon. You also said you wanted to coach the under 18s at Toulon. So yeah. have you had a chance to kind of map out what you might like to do in the future? Or is it a case of just trying lots of different things at the moment? Would you like to be, I mean, Rafael Ibanez is the team manager at France. Is that the goal? Would you like to be a head coach, a positional coach? No, um, you know, uh, at this at this moment of my career, I didn't know if I gonna come back for play or not with my injuries. So I open, you know, uh, uh, I put on the table all the opportunity I can have. It's why I start last uh, last year coaching a uh, little bit under uh, 18. And uh, I, I like that. But it's like the same when they asked me for the team manager. And uh, it was new. And now I like that. So um, sometimes you have to to take some decision at this moment i'm a team manager of toulon i don't have time to coach the under 18 
but maybe in two years, four years, if I if I won't stop, I know, and um, I know I can have the opportunity to do this in Toulon because uh, um, they, they are very uh, nice with me. But I don't have uh, a goal uh, to be uh, the team manager of the French team or no. Um, I just want. I'm happy to 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 be uh, in uh, in Toulon. I just want uh, uh, anything anything I can do uh, for you know put Toulon uh, like when I played in the top place in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, you know, re- recreate something, uh, and uh, that we I think we we lost uh, those years, and um, now it's my only goals now. Macha, thanks so much for coming on and talking to us, and good luck this weekend with the um uh, work, work if we can call it that. Yeah, with Johnny. it's a work. It's a work. <laughs> it's a work. <laughs> Hopefully you get to see a France win anyway at Murrayfield. Yes, yes. That is it's going to be a tough game. Win or lose, your work wife will show you a good time in Edinburgh anyway, so it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Your, only, your only role is to make it back, mate, because you've got number three dropping next week is to not drink too much whiskey, enjoy the game, make it back safely and get home for the birth <laughs> of your third child. So, mate, yeah. well done. Thanks all for joining us and uh, looking forward to this weekend. Should be epic. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. We covered a lot of bases there with Mathieu, but your your work husband, Johnny? Work wife, I don't know what we are. (laughs) Whichever way around you are, yeah. We're we're gender fluid these days, I don't know what we are. Um, He's probably Big Spoon, though, let's let's not kid ourselves, (laughs) he's a big old boy. Um, Mate, great to have him on, he's he's a great egg, uh, and loved by everyone over here, he's just, and again, he had that sort of, when he was playing, like, the image of, like, big, like baddie, you know, big bass that were like, he's, he's a big softy, really nice boy. Um, and yeah, like again, doing different bits. So working away with Toulon, he's obviously been a legend of the club, legend of the French team. He's now setting up his own bits. Um, I was filming with him yesterday. So if you go on YouTube, if you're a French, if you can speak a bit of French and tap in Basta show, you'll find his new show. He did week one with Baptiste Serrant to preview France, Ireland. We did this week in French to preview, um, Scotland, France. So he's dipping into different bits and, and like all of us, just finding his feet. But um, a top man um, and an absolute legend of the game. So let's carry on looking ahead to Scotland, France then. You're obviously going to be there with Basta. What did you make of Scotland last week, Johnny? Much has been said about it in the days afterwards. What did that second half from Scotland say mm-hmm. to you about them? It, it's hard. Um I think it shows what we already knew about Scotland, which is that they can be absolutely fantastic and on their day, give everyone a run for their money. And then they can be not fragile, but they're also, you can take them. You know, if you've got power and you generate intensity like Basta alluded to, you can pressurize them on the gain line. They then get squashed and they, they panicked a little bit in Cardiff, gave away penalties. I think it was something like 14 or 15 on the trot. Um, so there's nothing we didn't know. When they have ball and they're up against easy opposition, easy. Gatlin, by his own admission, that first half, that's the worst 40 minutes rugby he's ever produced as a coach. They were shambles. They won no line-out ball, no platform. Their kicking game was embarrassingly poor, and it was easy for Scotland. You had Ben White, his kicking game, superb. Uh, Finn Russell as well, superb. And, And Scotland didn't really have to do much to click into gear. And when they did, they were outstanding. Second half, and this is where the PTSD came in, um... 26 unanswered points. You're 27 nil up. If that's New Zealand or South Africa, it's a 60 or 70 point game. I don't care who the opposition are. They just foot on the throat and they they crack on and they and they demolish you. Um, where Scotland allowed them a foothold back into the game and, and Wales took it. 26 unanswered points in the second half. So Jekyll and Hyde, and it doesn't move us any further forward. Um, again, for the historians, they'll look back in five games time and it doesn't matter what happened. It's, it's a box tick they won that game first time in 20 years and um, that they've won in Cardiff so that's all positive but the sort of manner is it the manner of it still doesn't leave me completely convinced that Scotland are able to dine at the top table consistently with your South Africa's your New Zealand's your France's and your Ireland's that's still my um, worry that being said they're at home this weekend where they have a recent 
decent track record against the French. Um, they will feel confident. Um, but I worry about this French team going over there um, that they have been prodded and it's a sort of hornet's nest that's about to be unleashed. Um, and if there is one area that Scotland won't be able to cope with France, it is that power game. It is up front, gain line collisions, Dante, Fiku, midfield. It's Greg Aldrich coming around the corner. It's Antonio at scrum time. It's that power. Um, a little bit less so in the second row now. It looks like they might go with Walkie and Gabriel Lag if they don't go to Lagi, but that's the one bit that worries me for Scotland um, is that power game. You mentioned that. Obviously, Scotland have got their injuries as well. Richie Gray, Luke Crosby out, but Grant Gilchrist, Rory Darge back. So arguably, they might be improved in that respect. But certainly, if that is the the swap, it's, it's not losing too much, perhaps in depth on the bench. France's selection, we mentioned it a little bit with Mathieu. You said it there. If it's Gabriel and Wocky, is that underpowered a little bit? Would you not go for someone a bit more physically dominating and you mentioned Halaga who might, might be on the bench yeah um for Scotland is sort of much of a muchness the only danger I would say like Crosby being out is more of a physical presence Darge then brings you the turnover presence of an out and out open side which they maybe didn't have last week so that is if France have a bigger pack do you maybe lack in speed therefore there's opportunity for somebody like Darge who is exceptional over ball to generate that turnover ball that's so hard to defend against so like Darge for me brings a real point of difference for Scotland um, for France it's weird I mean yes maybe if you're moving a big old unit like Paul Valemsi at five you're bringing in Walkie, but then you're maybe probably boosting that line out that was shocking against the Irish so you maybe have a little bit less power but you're getting back your set piece and your ball at source which you didn't have last week which gives you a foothold in the game so I, I don't know everything to be balanced then obviously you got two laggy and maybe Matias, as he alluded to, Halagu coming off the bench, but they're very young. This is the thing, like Manny Miafu would be more of a sure thing, I would say, like more game time, more experience, more know-how around big games, having been there and done it for Toulouse, whereas Tulagi and Halagu, it's a different level they've been playing at this year. Um, so yeah, maybe a little bit in power shift out of the starting team, but maybe they need to short to shore up their line out. So you could see why they would bring those two boys in to start in the second row. And are you predicting a France backlash? Are you predicting a Scotland win? Where, where is it going to be more than the loss? Is it that physicality again? Or do you think Scotland can play around France? I don't know. You look at, for instance, the try that Scotland generated um, where Finn Russell essentially walked under and gave Duhan van der Merwe a two-on-one. Um, and that comes from the distance of pass from nine to a cell, eliminating defenders, and then a second phase repeating the same with that pod of two Apollo, two Hugh Jones, and Finn Russell at the back. That's their pivot, and that's how they generate space. If they're allowed to do that at Murrayfield, I think it could be difficult for France. If France get the upper hand physically and with their blitz defense at, fifth, at the full complement of 15 men on the field... I think they could beat Scotland at Murrayfield. But like, weirdly, I, I think Scotland going to this game as favourites, um, which I probably wouldn't have said, or generally wouldn't say, but I just think given there, haven't, there hasn't been too much change to the Scottish backroom staff, the players all know each other inside out. France has a little bit of transition uncertainty and therefore that knocks confidence. Either they come out health leather and they obliterate everything or they come out and they get things wrong. And against Finn Russell... You don't want to be over-reading, over-chasing and getting things wrong. And that's where feel they might just have one or two opportunities that they create by defensive creaks. As we mentioned, the defensive record, four tries in the last couple of games. Uh, and I feel like that might be exploited by um, by Scotland. Also, like you look at how they wanted to kick against the Welsh. I think Scotland will go to the air, try and pressurise the French back three and they won't give them anything. So I think it'll be a tough old game, tight, but I think Scotland might just nick it which I know won't appease or please our um, French followers and fans, but that's where I'm going this weekend. And a very quick word on the other games. You were pretty scathing about England last week, so I'm guessing you weren't too impressed by them against Italy. Do you think they'll beat Wales at Twickenham? Yeah, I do. Um, and I think they'll have too much. Um, and I still don't think they show that much. And that they're probably paying, playing within themselves with the systems and structures and attacking templates that they're using. But... I still feel even at maybe 85% of their full capacity, they will beat Wales at Twickers. 
And then I actually, the other team that I was really pleased for and impressed for were Italy under Gonzalo Quesada. I mean, they're going to Ireland. They're not going to win in Dublin, but that was a big positive statement performance. I know they lost the game, but touching distance of beating England. Um, and I was really chuffed for Gonzalo Quesada. Uh, coming in, new coach, well-received by everybody, uh, positive display. Um, so it was really enjoyable to watch them play some nice stuff against the English as well. Thanks, Johnny. Big thanks to Matthew Bastro for joining us. And thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe, leave us a nice review if you can, check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, mate. Bye.